Amen and amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Part of the team that came over from Magnolia as well. Appreciate your help today over here. Y'all give me another praise the Lord. It's good to see you this morning. Y'all smile. Okay, we're taking pictures. <laughs> You'll be getting a notice in the mail. <laughs> it's good to see you today. It's Labor Day weekend. We got folks out and traveling. To pray for their safety as they make their way back home. And uh, praise the Lord that summer's about over. It just drives me crazy about every summer. But we've been studying in the book of Nehemiah, and this is part nine in our last of the series of Nehemiah that we've been sharing together. And we've been talking about uh, the power of our influence that God's given us. That we're here to make a difference. And we've talked about how Nehemiah becomes a perfect role model of what a real, genuine, spiritual leader is like. Every one of us, remember, we've talked about, is called to a place of influence. We are the salt and the light of the world, the Bible says. You know, we're the city that's set on the hill. That means that every one of us have a part of making a difference in the culture and in the world that we live in. And I think we're only successful in life as we're doing that for the glory of God. We're only successful in life if we discover our place in his purpose and in his will for our life. Most important thing we ever discover is where, where we're headed and what life is really all about. And we discover that ultimately in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in this book of Nehemiah, this is kind of a wrap-up sermon of Nehemiah's life and what characterized his life in so many different ways. You know, we started the study, we started looking to see the kind of man that Nehemiah was and the integrity which he personally had in his life and his dependability in life and then how that affected so many of his decisions and the process of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Those walls have been down for over 100 years. Now he's there. Others had come before him to rebuild the walls but had not succeeded. Remember we talked about how he succeeded. Not only did what was impossible, he did it in 52 days against all kinds of opposition, external opposition, internal opposition, but he stayed true to the course and he finished the task that was before him. In fact, we saw last week and the week before how he stayed for 12 years as governor in the land and God gave him leadership over that. But I want to wrap all this up, talk about, I think, one of the most important character qualities that we can see in Nehemiah's life. Remember when we, we, we first read from Nehemiah chapter 1, the verse where he talked about how he first heard about the walls of Jerusalem in verse 4. He said, I sat down after hearing the, how the, the city was depressed, the people were defeated, the walls were down, there was no protection for God's city. And it says that he wept. He mourned, he fasted, and he prayed. That's all in the first chapter. But after that, you see him now moving out of that position of seeking God's face, understanding God's will for his life. He moved out and did the will of God for his life. As we looked at this, we, we saw very clearly that probably his process of decision-making was like ours. When he hears Hanani, his brother, tell him how bad things are in Jerusalem, remember, he's the cupbearer for the king Artaxerxes in the, I mean, he's about number two in line in the kingdom. He's got a great place of importance and a great place of privilege. And he's kind of the chief of security and cupbearer for the king. But he leaves all that palace, you know, uh, uh, blessing and all the extravagances of life that he's been enjoying in the lavish life of the palace. And he moves out to go to Jerusalem and undertake this incredible, incredible, you know, task of rebuilding the wall. But his response gives us so much insight to what kind of person he was and why God used him in, in the way that he moved and, and used him in his life. We see him doing so much for the will of God. So he's moving out. He's got a burden. Like I say, probably the same kind of process that you and I go through. We have a burden for something. We pray about something. We think about something. And then God begins to speak to our heart about it. I think every ministry in the church has begun like that. At, at, at this church, and somebody had a burden for it. Somebody came up and said, you know, I really feel that maybe we should be doing this at the church. Now, understand that if you're that kind of person, you've been through that process, you know my responses. You know, you've come to me and you said, Pastor, I believe this is what the church ought to be doing. Now, that means in Joe language, Pastor, this is what the Lord's leading me to do. <laughs> so I'm saying at the same time, when do we get started? You know, what can I do to help you? How can we equip you? How can we move out and do this ministry that the Lord's telling you to do? In fact, according to Ephesians, that's the role of the pastor, to equip the ministry for the work of the saints. And so the idea here is that he has this burden. And like we get these burdens in our life or, you know, we see, have a passion for something that the Lord's placed in our, in our heart and life. And we'll talk a little bit more towards the end of this message how that works, how God works in us to give us that. But 
I, probably he's just broken. Probably he just has this burden. He sees the things aren't the way they are. But as he begins to weep and fast and pray about this every day, he begins to realize you're the guy, Nehemiah. You're the guy I want to do this. You're the guy I'm putting in the heart to do this. And he moves forward now and he starts making plans. And we talked about the whole process of what he did and how that if we're going to be effective leaders, those things really work the same way in our lives. You look and say, why overall does God choose Nehemiah? You see, just from that one passage, you see his sensitivity. He saw the need that was before him. He has a burden for it. You see, you see his, his, his availability. He says, Lord, it comes to the point now, if that's who you want to send, Lord, here I am. And the opportunity comes to appeal to the king and he does it. So you see also, and I think one of the things that's most important in this lesson is his dependability. You know, you can count on me is the mindset. You, I'll get it done, Lord. If this is what you want me to do. Here I am. I'm available to do it. I think that is probably one of the greatest character traits in Nehemiah's life of all the things you could say about him was this, this element, this, this integrity of heart that just pointed out the fact, here's a faithful individual. You can count on this guy. He's faithful. He's going to be there. In fact, you know, we just had a funeral, a memorial service for probably one of the most faithful men in, in our church. You know, uh, Brother Frank DeVort. He was one of, these, one of these guys, if you went to Siri and, or Google and watch him and ask for the definition of faithful, his picture would probably come up. Amen. I think one of the most startling remarks at that moral service is one that uh, Robbie made, you know, as, as, as we were having the testimony time and Robbie said, you know, uh, you know, we called Frank that, that morning because he wasn't here. He's usually the guy that's here making coffee, opening the doors and gates and everything else, but he didn't show that morning. So the, the question was, you know, would anybody miss us? You know, if, if, if we didn't show up, would anybody be calling us if we didn't show up? Because we're always there because we're so dependable because we're so faithful. This is Nehemiah's life. This is, what, this is what he's all about. And you see him moving in, in this kind of way. And it's against all oppositions, against all logic, against all reason, he keeps moving forward. Now, I'm not a big fan of the Good News Bible, but I like the way this verse is translated from the King James. The King James says this, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. The Good News puts it like this, everyone talks about how loyal and faithful they are, but just try to find someone who really is. <laughs> That's a powerful word, isn't it? Because most people, are you a faithful guy? I'm faithful. Are you a faithful woman? Yeah, I'm a faithful woman. Everybody's willing to, to declare their own faithfulness and their own loyalty. The Bible, God's question basically is this, but try to find one. And the answer is this, that there's not a lot of people who are what we would say are faithful people. And by that, I mean the context of this message and this passage and what the Bible teaches about this. I'm talking about people that you count on, people who are consistent. People are dependable. So that, that's that person, what we might say, they're, they're people of the word. We're living in a time and in a culture where that's not the norm. We're living in what's been called, not by me, but by others in the secular world, a day of disposable relationships. You know, we just, if, you know, if it's, it's, it's a time of little commitment. Uh, it's a time in, in, in the world right now where people don't want to commit to anything. They, they don't want to be committed to a business. They don't want to be committed to church. They don't want to be committed to their marriages. And there's this, this disposable mindset, you know. Uh, in fact, when we talk about faithful. The first word that comes to most people's mind is their dog, you know. Ah, that dog, he's faithful. Singing. That's the most faithful dog you'll ever, I mean, that, that's it. He's a good old boy, you know. And my, and my dog's faithful. Uh, yeah, I, I won't even go up to all the Old Testament illustrations that are really biblical in that the faithfulness of a dog should translate to the faithfulness of a human being in our relationship, that that mindset of, hey, I'll be there, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll, be, I'll stick to you with you through all this. So when I'm talking about faithfulness today, I am talking about dependability, reliability, consistency, trustworthiness. The Bible says everybody talks about how they are, but just try to find someone who really is. In Psalms 21, there's that passage in, in verse one where, he, where, where the psalmist makes this statement. It really starts out as a question. We're saying, Lord, help, because godly men are fastly disappearing. Where in all the world can a dependable men be found? I think that really is the cry of the age because we don't really think in our world today. It's, it's the world of me. It's the world of what I want and what makes me happy and what makes me feel better and, and what, you know, what benefits me. That's the way decisions are processed in most people's life today. It doesn't, have to, doesn't, doesn't generate beyond that of how I, can, how I can make a difference in somebody else's life or how I can make a difference in my world or how I can make a difference in my job or, or in my church. It, you know, it just it doesn't communicate today. In fact, here's a little exercise for you to do mentally. 
just think right now of maybe three, four, five names in your mind uh, that you could name right now people you know no matter what you could count on. Now, you got your list together. When you think about those names, this is people I, I know would be dependable. Or if I'm in trouble and I'm, I'm, I'm in a bad spot, they're going to help me out. Now, let me ask you this. Is your neighbors thinking about those names? Are you on their list? <laughs> Who, whose list would we appear on that says, hey, that person, that's the guy that's reliable. That's the person I can, I can count on. You know, we've always said that the greatest ability is dependability. And that's a true fact, that people are dependable, you know? In fact, scripture kind of says, you know, that, that if you're not a dependable person, then you really don't hold a lot of value in, 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 in the context of what real worth is. So as we wrap up Nehemiah, we're going to see that his guy is what is certainly one you can write down as dependable, faithful, reliable man. All right. When he said you can count on me, you could count on him. So I'm ask a couple of questions. One, we'll talk about why should we develop faithfulness? And I'll give you a few points under that. Second question I want to give you some points under is the characteristics of a faithful person. And then a very simple point on how to develop that character quality in your own life of what it really means to be a faithful and dependable person. First of all, why should we develop faithfulness? That's a good question. Let's answer it. There's about four or five reasons here. The, the first should be the most obvious to believers is to become more like our father. If anyone is dependable, if anyone is the, the epitome of all that in, the integrity of, of reliability and dependability is, it's, it's, our, it's our Heavenly Father. He's always dependable. You can always count on God. There's no point in your life where God's going to fail you. You may think he has, but one day your eyes will be open and you'll say, that was me. That wasn't God. That was a bad expectation, or that's what I thought it should be, or that's the way I thought it worked out. And you might see at that moment where you thought God failed you, he was doing you the greatest service. Because the Bible says God is so faithful, he makes sure that everything you experience in your Christian life works for the good. Even the bad, even the storms, even the trials, even the temptations can all be built into your life and make it develop you as a, as a deeper person of integrity. God is faithful. First of all, the Bible tells that God's faithful of whom you were called into fellowship of his son. Paul wrote the church, he said, hey, God's, God's been faithful. God's been faithful to you. Even when you didn't think you were faithful, he was faithful. And when you were not faithful, the Bible says, even while we were yet sinners, God called us. That's a faithful, loving God. That's the grace and mercy of God. But not only faithful in saving us, he's faithful in keeping us. The Bible tells us that God is faithful. and He'll not even allow you to be tempted above that which you're able. Now, I know some people don't believe that verse. And they say, oh, you just don't know the temptation I have to deal with. I'm just not able to overcome that temptation. Now, somebody's lying here, but let, let me just, I'm not a betting man, but let me bet here that it's not God. <laughs> All right? I, you sure it's not God? You say, well, Brother Joe, I just can't do it. I, I just don't have it within me. No, you don't, not within yourself. That's where you learn to trust God. That's where you learn to believe God. That's where you learn to find God's strength. That's where you learn to, to embrace God's abilities and powers in your life to do what needs to be done. But God, God's not going to forsake you. God's a faithful God. God's not going to give up on you. Even though you have failed miserably, God still loves you. He's still calling you. He's still wanting to work in your heart and your life. And people say, I just can't help myself. Not God that's lying. It's, it's them that's not being truthful about it. Because God's word makes it very clear. And on top of that, let me show you just how faithful God is. God is faithful to you and that, that if you do fail and when you do sin, that if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. That's a faithful God. You say, well, Brother Joe, you know, if I keep sinning, God's still forgiven. Understand this about, and this is, why I don't, I, this is why I believe God keeps us. God saved you on the basis of what Jesus did for you. Got that? Not what you did for Jesus or what you did for God. Right? We understand grace. God saved you on the basis of what his son did for you. Now, God accepts you on that basis, not your work. Works didn't save you, nor will works keep you saved. Keep you in God's grace and keep you. It's the covenant, precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that keeps you. All right? It's God's mercy and grace that he keeps you. But he does give us this, this promise of scripture that when we sin and if we'll be honest and if we'll be you know, realistic with ourselves and realize we fail God. If we confess our sins because of what Jesus did for you, God holds himself faithful to the covenant of the precious blood of Jesus and he will forgive your sins because Jesus paid for those sins. Because those sins have been purchased and the price that purchase was death, but he paid the price. 
And so he forgives you. God is a faithful God. That's why we should become faithful because we want to be like our heavenly father. But another reason is if we're going to work for the kingdom, if we're going to be involved in ministry and serving the Lord, hey, this is a qualification. Even Paul said, he wrote Timothy, he said, you know, first of all, when he's he's writing to Timothy, he said, I want to thank God that he counted me faithful and he put me in the ministry. All right. That God would count me dependable. That God said, you know, Paul, I can rely on you. I can rely on you. And that, that, that's probably one of the highest statements anybody could ever you know, make, I think, in regard to their own. And I don't think it's arrogance here. I think he's just saying, you know, God, God counted me as, as, as proven, as someone who was committed and who was trustworthy here. And it's not that I've qualified myself in that regard. It's just that God sees me that way. But then he went on to say to the church, he said, you know, I am sending Timothy to you because Timothy is faithful in the Lord and he'll remind you of my way of life in Christ. In other words, he's going to tell you how to live for Jesus. And he's a dependable guy. He's a faithful guy. So I'm sending him. I'm not going to send you somebody you can't trust. Somebody's not dependable. This guy is dependable. So I'm sending to you. So he says, Paul says, I'm in the ministry because God considered me faithful. I'm sending Timothy to you because I consider him faithful. And then he says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, these things, Timothy, I have Uh, You've heard of me through many witnesses, the same you will commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. He said, there's this ministry, you need to be faithful. God counted me faithful. Timothy's proven to be faithful. You can trust him. Timothy, now find other faithful men that we can trust and we'll be dependable and you can rely on to do what needs to be done in the kingdom work. So we see all of a sudden there's a very clear picture of the importance of our dependability and our our faithfulness to the Lord, you know, to, 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 to... stand and have this characteristic in our life of dependability because it is a qualification for being involved in serving the Lord faithfully and being a dependable witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. The third thing we need and the reason why we need to be dependable is because it is a guarantee of God's blessings on our life. It is a guarantee. You know, the Bible tells us the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord and he ponders all his going. That's just one of hundreds of scriptures that talk about the fact that God's observing our life. In 2 Chronicles, it said, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking for someone who is faithful, whose heart is right. And over and over, scripture shows that there's this loving God wanting to bless somebody's life, use somebody's life, make a difference in their life, but he's looking for someone whose heart's right, who's faithful, who's dependable. And if when they find that person, multiple times. You see how God blesses that person, uses that person, ministers that person, and then, you know, because their life counts for something. Does your life count for something? Are we we even conscious of the fact that God's eyes are going throughout the whole universe, throughout the whole earth, and he's looking for somebody who'll just say, here I am, Lord, use me. Here I am. I'm not anything spectacular. I'm not anything wonderful, but if you can do something here, I'll be reliable, I'll be dependable, I'm gonna trust you, I'm gonna follow you. I just wanna serve you. The issue here ultimately is that I'm not, I may be serving the body of Christ, but really I'm serving the Lord. So if I'm serving the Lord and understand that it's him I'm I'm seeking approval from and not the the crowd, then I'll be content with the Lord's approval. You know, I I won't have to have people pat me on the back and tell me how great I am. You know, I don't have to have people tell me what a wonderful sermon that was, Brother Joe, because I don't have time to not tell me the truth anyway. <laughs> I don't have to have somebody, you know, you know, attend the pity party with me when I go there. <laughs> Amen. Because it, it's it, ultimately it's the Lord that we serve. And if we can settle in on that and lock in on that man, then the blessings of God and the fullness of God will come into your heart and life. But when we're not, you know, and and we're not being consistent, we're not being reliable, then, well, Proverbs 29, 5 puts it like this. It's like a bad tooth or a lame foot when you rely on somebody that's unfaithful in the times of trouble. Y'all know what a bad tooth like, right? Y'all know what a lame foot's like? You ever broken your ankle or even just strained those tendons in in, in, in your leg and, you know, you can't put your weight on it, you're hobbling around, you, you know, it's frustrating to have to go through that process. What he's saying, he says, you know, people that you can't depend on in times of trouble produce irritation. <laughs> I, I, maybe you had a service call this week. You needed something fixed at the house. You placed a service call and they said, we'll be there at nine o'clock. And then they didn't show. Amen. Is that irritating? Amen. And that it bugs me, you know, they, you know, it's nine o'clock. They're supposed to be there. Now it's 930. They're not there. Now it's 931. I'm really mad. 
10 o'clock shows up and I'm frustrated. 10.01, now I'm really just double what I was at 10. And then all day goes by, you called the office three times, yeah, we're coming, and they don't show. That's like that bad tooth. That's like that, that bad ankle. You can't, you can't put any weight on it. You can't depend on it. And it's frustrating. The difference is here, you know, we can experience frustration and create frustration by our lack of dependability, or we can experience the blessings of God on our life because we choose to be a dependable people and a trustworthy people. What are we going to do? The next is that it prepares me for leadership. And Nehemiah, we go back to him, Nehemiah is now governor over the land. He says, you know, I gave Hanani, who was Nehemiah's brother, I gave him charge over Jerusalem. Why? Because he's your brother? No. Because he was a faithful man. And he feared God above everybody else. That's a pretty powerful testimony, is it not? That's the kind of people you want to put your trust in and your faith in. This guy believes God. He has a fear, a righteous fear of God in his life. He loves God and he's committed to God. And so that's the guy who, who gets to experience the, the blessing of leadership on his life because he's been faithful. The Bible says in Matthew 25, who then is a faithful and wise servant? It's that parable on the, of, of the, the guys who get the talents. You know, who's the guy? He's the one whom the master placed over in charge over the other servants. So he mentions here, the faithful one is the one the Lord puts in charge. The faithful one, the one the Lord's going to use. The faithful one is the one God's going to do something in and through and with their life. Once in a while, I meet somebody and the first week they come to the church, you know, they kind of give you the impression that in their mind, you can almost read, really well, I'm here, I'm ready to take the reins. You know, the solution for Believer's Fellowship has arrived and, you know, have no fear, Superman's here. Amen. And, I, I, and they kind of let me know they're ready to assume whatever leadership role I have for them. And I think for just a moment, hold on. I don't know you. Well, I used to be the pastor. At, I still don't know you. You have no track record with us. Come on in, get on board, serve the Lord, and we'll see where it goes. And if you're faithful, then we'll do it the biblical thing. We'll follow the biblical model of then upon the, this, this element of being a proven, you know. And that's what Paul said about Timothy. It's kind of like, I, Timothy's proven. He's shown faithfulness. Then you get the responsibility. The fifth reason why we all should want to develop this, this element and this, of, of integrity and faithfulness in our life is because, hey, it's going to be rewarded in heaven. Matthew 25, his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. Ultimately, folks, I think we've got to get back to living our lives with, a, with, our, with our mind, yes, in the present world, but with an understanding and a daily clear reminder to ourselves that one day we will all stand before the Lord. And one day the Bible says that not just the lost will give an account, but every believer will give an account of how we use what God gave us, all right? And so I'm gonna have to stand before the Lord one day and give an account for my life. You know, did I make a difference? Did God use me? Did I participate in the will of God and the purposes of God for my life? Or did I look for excuses and, you know, kind of bail out? I mean, if you're looking for a goal and a purpose for life, let's make this your goal. That you would hear the Lord say to you one day, well done. You did good. Yeah, I know you blew it at times. I know you fell in your faith, but you fell in the right direction and you kept coming back and you, you pressed through and you served me and you loved me and you were committed to me and you made a difference in, in the world around you. And the Bible says that would be rewarded. Now, if you go back to the parable, you know, the talents, one guy gets one, one gets, I think, what is it, five, and the other gets 10. And at the end, remember the story of the guy that had one, got it taken from him, given to the guy that had 10. He said, it's not fair. Why'd that happen? It happened because the guy with one wasn't faithful. He wasn't faithful. Now, this is the, this is a tragedy. You may be kind of a Joe Arms type. You don't have a lot to offer. You know? You just got one talent, and it's not a very big amount. <laughs> you know? But, but you got that. Amen. You know? And you're going to say... I'll use that for the Lord. Now, some people in that position say, I don't have much to offer, so I won't offer anything. It's not much. It's only a little bit. I can't do much. And so since I can't do much, I won't do anything. They kind of live with that attitude. You know, if anything's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly. <laughs> you know, they, and it's like they bury the talent, you know. Well, I'm nobody. I don't have the looks. I don't have the personality. I don't have this. I don't have chops for that, you know. And, and you just... So you just don't use what God's given you. The Bible says that the, what happens here is that you just basically forfeit. You don't faithfully use what the Lord's given you. 
You just, you, you know, you just, you just commit yourself to him. And that's strong stuff when you follow the flow of that story. The Lord says, take it from that, listen how he categorizes the, that worthless servant. I don't want to stand before the Lord and be that worthless servant. I love God. I, Jesus died for me. You look to the cross and you see that what he endured for us that we might be saved. It ought to be something that motivates us to say, I want to serve God. I want to love him. He loved me. That's what John said. But we love him because he first loved us. And our motivation for our loving him is the deep love that he has in our lives. And we understand it clearly. Those are some pretty good reasons why we ought to develop faithfulness. But let me give you two simple characteristics of what a faithful person is. One is this. And I think it's important. And you say, why is it important? Because... It's what we're going to be examined according to in Scripture when we do stand before the Lord. So you may want to take notes because this is like the final exam. <laughs> this is where we're going to be held accountable. All right. These are the characteristics that, that the Lord wants us to develop in our life. Biblically, scripturally, these things that God's laid out for us that we need to pay attention to. I don't want to be the worthless servant. And I certainly don't believe anybody in this room wants to be the worthless servant. Amen. We want to be that person who honors the Lord with our life. So how do you be the faithful person? I think one of the most important is this, is that one, you have embraced biblical values in your life. You know, you, you've embraced biblical values. This is passage that talks about value and importance in Proverbs, one of many, but in 28, 20, it says, a faithful man will be richly blessed, but one eager to get rich, you know, will not go unpunished. What's the difference between these two guys? It's what's driving them. It's what's motivating them. One has this, 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 this mindset of, and this characteristic and this integrity of heart that says, I, I want to be that dependable person. And God says, that's the guy I'm going to bless, like we just, just talked about. But the person whose goal is just to get and to accumulate, which is pretty much the spirit of this age that we live in, they're not going to have anything. And it says they're not going to go unpunished. And ultimately, they'll, they'll lose what they had because they, they, they didn't give what they had to the Lord to start with. It's, it's the contrast between the person who wants to be faithful and the, the mindset of let's just get rich and let's get rich quick. Yeah. Where, where are the value system? And I really believe he's talking about the system of, uh, that we live in that's so materialistic. It's just based on that material things will make me happy. If I accumulate more and I get more, then you know, I make a bigger buck and that becomes my primary goal in my life, then, then, then things are going to be wonderful. This is what is so to me, this is what is so horrendous about the prosperity movement within the church today and the prosperity gospel. It's all about you getting more from God, you know? And, and, and the idea is that God wants to make you rich. God does want to bless you. And I want you to know you'll experience the greatest blessings of God. But some of the richest people I know are, haven't got anything to do with money. They've understood the wealth of living a life and the abundance of Christ in their life and they enjoy living and they, they live a happy life and they enjoy their family, they enjoy their friends, they enjoy their church, they enjoy the Lord and their life is just has a peacefulness and a grace about it. That's rich. People would die for that. They could just by dying to themselves and coming to Jesus. But faithfulness is proven, I think, by our refusal to buy into this kind of system in the world that says the almighty dollar is number one and that's the most important thing. Because when we buy into that, we fail and fail miserably. So it's important we understand we have a, a right value system and it's based upon eternal values. It's based upon the word of God, it's not based upon the world's philosophy of what it means to have full life. It's based on what the scripture says. A faithful person, number two, cares for the interests of others. It's not just about themselves. You know? Do we care about the relationships of other people, not just our own relationships? Paul said, uh, these are powerful. I, I don't have anybody like Timothy. What makes Timothy so special? Because he's not just concerned about his own welfare. He's concerned about your welfare is the passage. He's proved himself worthy. Why? For everyone looks after their own interest and not those of Jesus Christ. But Timothy has proved himself and he has served with me in the work of the gospel. Timothy's going to be a benefit for you. Why is he going to be such a benefit? Because he cares about you. Timothy's going to be a blessing to you. Why? Because he loves you. Timothy's truly concerned about your life and the work of God and God working in your life. So I'm sending somebody who's not like anybody else maybe you've seen before. This guy really cares about other people. Hey, that kind of testimony is better than being in the book of who's who because it puts you in the book of God's who's who, amen? That I'm gonna be there. Contemporary culture doesn't 
dictate that. Contemporary culture says, what's in it for me? What am I going to get out of this deal? Even people select churches like that. What can they do for me? You know, what can they do for my kids? What can they do for my family? And they're looking at programs more than they're looking at what's the will of God. It's just where God wants me. Where should I serve? Where can I invest my life? Where can I make a difference? Where can I join with other people of like faith and like spirit and like heart? And we can do something in the world for the glory of God. And in people's lives, it'll touch your life and make a difference in the world they live in. This, this thing of Christianity really is, it's an abandonment to yourself. And you come back to what Jesus said. Now, when they ask him, what's... What's the biggest thing here? I mean, what's the most important deal? What's the greatest commandment? I mean, what, what's the top of the heap here? I mean, let's rule out everything. I mean, all the people, what's the meaning of life? They go to the shamans to find it out. Jesus told you what it, what it was. He says, here's what it's all about, guys. You love God with all your heart, mind, soul, body, and strength. Amen. And you love your neighbors yourself. Whoa. I'm expecting something else. <laughs> I need another answer. Why? Because I don't want to love God with all my heart, mind, soul, body, and strength. I don't want to love my neighbor myself. I can't stand my neighbor. <laughs> Jesus said, this is the first and the greatest of all the commandments. Simply put, there's your purpose for living right there. And if you can put that in the, in the front of the list, make that the primary thing, then it's going to change your life. But not only will it change your life, it's going to change people around you. It's going to change their life for the better, for the greater. So this person you know, is going to realize that I'm here for the glory of God and I'm here to be used by God in a difference in making other people's lives different. Third, the faithful person lives a life of integrity before an unbelieving world. If you're going to live the Christian life as this is laid out for us in the New Testament, you know as well as I, it's like swimming upstream in a forceful stream. The world's going one direction. You know, the Bible says there's two roads, a broad road, narrow road. Broad road leads to hell, many there on it. It's popular. It's what's happening. It's where most are going. The narrow road, Leads to life. But let me tell you where those roads are. They're not like in two different locations. I think the narrow road's right in the middle of the broad road going the other direction. And you've got all this opposition of the world, your own flesh, the devil, all the temptation. All these things are constantly coming at you. And you have to keep your eyes, your heart, and your mind on being that dependable, faithful person of the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting him. And what happened? He's carrying you right upstream. And I think the real mark of a dependable person is that they can stand in the midst of the opposition and keep moving that direction. Amen. Daniel is a great testimony of that as well as Nehemiah. He saw Nehemiah, all those people around him and government and leaders and all those similar people, they were opposed to what he's doing because he's doing the will of God. And they were fighting him, resisting him. Even people in his own group resisted what he was doing. But he kept moving against the opposition and kept moving for a dependable and faithful those were those Chaldeans and those people in, in the kingdom where Daniel was and they were seeking to destroy him. It says they looked, you know, and they saw how Daniel lived his life and they were jealous of Daniel. But the last of that verse says, but they couldn't find anything to criticize because he was what? Faithful, honest in his matters. He made no mistakes. Just a faithful guy. Let me tell you, let me tell you how reliable and honest and decent Daniel was. If you had a wad of money in your wallet, you could leave it on the table with just Daniel in the room and walk out. Amen. Daniel's not going to get into it. It's not his money. In fact, he'll watch over it for you. Make sure nobody else got into it. He's just staying true. That's the characteristic of what faithfulness is. It means that I'm going to bend and believe and trust in the Lord no matter what. Number four, since you're listening so fast, I'll keep moving fast. A faithful person keeps his word. He doesn't make promises that he's not going to keep. Proverbs 25 talks about like clouds and wind without rain is a man who boasts of gifts that he does not give. Listen, if I had all the gifts in ministry and in the church life that people said they were going to give the church, we would be independently wealthy here at Believer's Fellowship. There's property over on 45 we would own that was given to us at one time. Never got the title. There's property down at Crystal Beach that was given to us. Never got the title. I mean, there's been property, and my wife can attest to this, and people think, we're going to give this to the church, but you never get the title. You know, and you're all excited. Learn a long time, and don't get too excited until you see the title. <laughs> because there are people who are like clouds and wind without rain. They look like they're going to do something for the glory of God, and they don't do it. You know, for whatever reason, whatever happens, and many times they spoke before they heard from God. Sometimes they heard from God and didn't follow through, but whatever it was, we have to realize that God's going to evaluate us on the basis of what we said 
Did we do what we said we would do? Were we faithful? You know, and it's from the little things to the big things. When you tell your kids, we're going to go to this place, guess what? That's a promise to them. And you need to be careful because even if you so say, ah, we'll think about it. No, that's a promise to them. <laughs> and usually we say, I'll think about it because we don't want to deal with it right then and there, right? We're busy. So be careful what you say. Be careful what you tell people you, you're going to do. It ought to, when you think about what the Bible says about this and making vows and not following through with them, it doesn't mean don't make vows. It means make vows and keep them. Let your yea be yea and your nay be nay, the Bible says. In other words, you say you're going to do something, do it. If you're not going to do it, tell, tell, I ain't going to do it. All right, just be honest. Say, I can't do that. You say, well, they're not going to like me. Be honest. Be truthful because that's the person who's showing genuine character. So whether it's as a pastor, whether it's a parent, whether it's an individual in the church, if you say you're going to take care of something, then take care of it. If you say you're going to take on a ministry, take on the ministry. Don't blame somebody if it doesn't get done. Go do what God called you to do. Proverbs 20, verse 25 says, it is a trap to dedicate something rashly and only later consider your vow. In other words, you're going to fall into a trap. If you say, I'll do that, and you didn't even consider it, you didn't pray about it, you didn't think about it, you didn't think that was what you're supposed to do, and then bail out on it later. But same time, it's a trap to fall and say, I'll do it, no, you've been called to it, and still not do it. That's a lack of character. The, it, I think the number one, I think, cause of resentment in most people's life is unfulfilled promises. People said they'd do something for you, help you, whatever it was, come be there with you, whatever, and they didn't do it. The Bible says in Psalm 15, whoever does what he promises, no matter how much it may cost, will always be secure. In other words, you said you'd do it, and you got later, and you think about, well, that's going to be harder than I thought, bigger than I thought, cost more than I thought. You do it anyway. God says, that's the kind of person always be secure. Why? Because they're a faithful person. King James Version says, whoever swears to his own hurt. I say, it may hurt me, it may kill me. I'm still going to do it. Cause, why? Because I said I'd do it. But it's going to cost you more than you thought. I've, I've made some of those kind of commitments before. And somebody said, I'll help you out. In fact, it's going to cost me about twice what you thought it was. You still do it. You don't look for a way out. You say, well, I shouldn't have done that. You know? Well, you shouldn't have, but you did. <laughs> so do what you said you do. Say, yes, I'll do it, or no, I won't do it. And then stand by your word. The fifth is this. The faithful person develops and uses their spiritual gift. Now think about this just for a minute. First Peter says, each of you should use whatever spiritual gift he's received. Why? To serve others faithfully, administering God's grace in various forms. The Bible's very clear in multiple places and locations from Corinthians to Romans to Ephesians that God gives each one of us that are believers in Jesus a gift, right? We all have a spiritual gift. All right. What's that mean? It means that God made an investment in you. God invested something in you. And he expects you and me to understand what that gift is. And we do that through prayer and study of scripture to understand what our gifts are. And then he expects me not only to have an understanding of what it is, but to use it. All right. Well, what if I don't use what God invested in me? Is that just okay? Or when the final exam comes around, I'm going to have to answer for that. I'm going to have to answer for that. All right? Right? I'm going to have to answer for that. Did you do? Did you use the gift I gave you? And, and where do I use it? Well, let me tell you, the Bible says it's the body of Christ. We use the gift in the body of Christ. The kingdom of God for the kingdom work. But it, it takes place. It's exercised. The Bible says it's like a body. We have one body, but many members. The church is one body, but many members. God gives each member so they can do what that, you know, you know, my right hand has, it has the gift of being a hand. Amen. Knows it's a hand. If it ever tries to be a foot, it causes me all kinds of problems. All right. If it tries to be my tongue, it absolutely gets in the way. But it's my hand. It knows it's hand. My leg, my right leg knows it has the gift of being the right leg and cooperates. Now, if I should have some kind of mental problem, some kind of damage to my brain, maybe my right leg thinks it's the left leg. All right. That creates a lot of problems, right? A lot of issues. There can be all kinds of physical maladies, but in the spiritual life, we should be understanding who we are. What, I mean, that's one of the reasons we have our 301 journey class to teach people what their spiritual gifts are so they can faithfully do with that gift what God's called them to do. You're not going to be able to say, well, Lord, and God says, why didn't you use your gift? Oh, I did. Well, what was your gift? Pew warmer. I had the gift, pew warming. See how warm my bottom is? I warmed up every seat, 98 point whatever it is. 
Got it nice and toasty warm. Next guy come along, knew somebody had been there. I warmed it. There's no gift of pew warming. All right, it's just not to be found. Faithful person will manage his time, his talent, his treasures. Not only spiritual gift, he measures those other gifts in the Lord, which is time, which he does give us talents, which he gives us, you know, treasures and, and the blessings of life. Luke 16 says, you know, if we're not faithful in handling those worldly things and worldly with, how's God going to trust us with the true riches? Well, where are the true riches? Well, I believe they can be experienced now, and that's the peace, the life, the love, the joy, the fullness, the grace of God on our life, the blessings of God. But I think that deals more so with after this life, when we stand at the bema seat of Christ and the rewards are given, are not given based upon faithfulness. And God wants to bless us with true riches. But again, we're living in such a materialistic world and we're so bound by it, we just, we just miss the mark. And you know, Paul told the church on every Sunday, you should put aside something according to the blessings of God on your life. What does that mean? In other words, there's a gift that are, that are, that are given based on, based on a percentage. Now, the Old Testament gives us a standard. I think that's a good place to start, all right? But there's a percentage. That portion of my income should go back to the kingdom, back to the Lord for the work of the ministry so it can be a blessing to other people. People struggle with this because, again, it's an issue of character, ultimately, spiritual character and spiritual integrity. Will I give to the Lord or not give to the Lord? Well, the Lord doesn't need my money. No, he doesn't, but you need to give it. It's a demonstration of your faithfulness. You know, what happened? Like, try that with the government. They want their little portion, right? You say it very little. No, it isn't, right? Try that with the government. You know, in fact, you, most of the time, unless you're self-employed, the government's real good, I mean, about getting your employer to take it out for them. All right? And then give them a little bit more towards it. Try to just say, I'm not going to do that. Some of you may have done that and you find yourself in trouble with the infernal revenue service. <laughs> Amen? It didn't work that way. We just need to be faithful people in God's kingdom. Most important thing going on in the world today is God's kingdom and the will of God and the work of God. A faithful person learns how to manage those things that God's blessed him with faithfully. A faithful person is one who comes to the point in their life, they just realize it's all about the Lord and his will and his word and they obey what the Lord tells them. First Samuel 2.35, God says, I will raise up a faithful priest to serve me and do whatever I tell him to do. If you open that up in your Bible, good thing to do, take a pencil or a highlighter, mark or circle that word, whatever. Now that word means something different in the culture today. A whatever. <laughs> How many of y'all use that before? Whatever. Whatever. Hey, this is what we're supposed to say, Lord, whatever. Whatever you want. I think we get in trouble when we try to reserve stuff from God. We can't honestly keep our hands up and say before him, hey, Lord, I said I surrender all. I mean it. What do you need? What would you like from me? Where do you want to take me? What do you want to do with my life? It, that's, that's defines faithfulness more than anything else. And it starts with that heartbeat of just Lord whatever. The eighth thing and the last thing is this. Like Timothy, you realize that you're here to make a difference in people's life. And so you're passing on. You're sharing, you're discipling, you're mentoring, you're coaching, whatever terminology you want to use, you're counseling other people. You're sharing what God's done in your life. You become a transfer agent for the kingdom work. Paul told Timothy, you commit these things to faithful men who will be able to teach other people also. That's faithfulness. We take what's been given us and we use it for the glory of God and we pass it on to the next person, to the next generation. I'm to be faithful and I'm to be faithful with whatever God's given me, all right? It has to do with everything the Lord's put in my hands and I'm to share that and to teach other people what God's done in my life and to use it for the glory of God. First Corinthians says it's required that those who've been given a trust must prove what? Faithful. We've been given a trust. Have we not? Have we not been blessed? Has not God guaranteed heaven for you? Has not God guaranteed his presence in your life? Has not God guaranteed his sufficiency for all your needs in your life? Has not God met you and taken care of you? That's a trust. And he wants you to bring other people into that life and into that fellowship and into that relationship. A little later on, we'll talk about a National Back to Church Sunday is one of the announcements today that in a couple of Sundays, it's National Back to Church Sunday. There's thousands, tens of thousands of churches all over the, of the nation of all denominations just participating this particular Sunday. 
it's kind of a national platform to invite people back to church. And when there's a platform given like that, I, I try to always seize those opportunities when they're righteous platforms to get on them. So our church is participating in the National Back to Church Sunday. What, what's required of stewards at that point is we be faithful to bring people back to church, you know? But that's something not just for one Sunday. There's all around us people who are just out of fellowship or had a bad experience in some church and quit going to church or, you know, something that happened or some brother failed them on some part and, you know, or people just got now the habit of going. They perhaps moved from somewhere and didn't get back in church or something happened in their life and they slowly kind of slipped out, you know, and hadn't slipped back in. And this is your opportunity to reach out to so many different people and say, hey, it's, it's National Back to Church Sunday. Come on, we're having church. It's going to be great service. You're going to enjoy it. At the same time, we'll be in a series of messages I think that'll transform their life on the end times and on prophecy. But hey, it gets down to this. The Bible tells us, and this I think is a, is a theme verse for being faithful. He says, you be instant in season, out of season. In other places, always be ready to give an answer about the hope that lies within you. Be that person who communicates, who shares the blessings of God that he has placed in your trust with other people as well. Be the faithful person. Last question was, how do I become faithful? Well, it's pretty simple. The Bible tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness. So what does that mean? I get back where I need to be in my walk with God. You say, what does that mean? I don't think I have to tell you. That's the, that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He'll tell you where you're wrong. He'll tell you where you need to straighten up. He'll tell you what you need to stop and what you need to start. I mean, that's my experience with the Holy Spirit. How about you? <laughs> he knows how to deal with me. He knows how to deal with you. But will we listen? The fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness. You say, what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Boy, you pose that question today, you'll get a million answers. But let me tell you what it simply means. It means that God's in control of my life today. I'll start my life today. God, take control of my life. God, be in charge of my life. This is your day, Lord. I want you to take control of my life. And then you start being faithful to him. And what happens? He empowers you by his internal presence in your life to fulfill that faithfulness. You can't do it without him. Amen. It's leaning on the Holy Spirit. It's trusting in the Holy Spirit. It's obeying the Holy Spirit. It's being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Saying, speak when he tells you to speak. Well, I don't have the, I don't have the person. You do it anyway. And you find out you do have what it takes to be that person. That's the power of God's presence in your life. And that's the beauty of the faithfulness of God. That's why I love what he told Peter. And he said, Peter, you guys, you know, he didn't say it out loud. I, mean, I, I would have thought it. We're just a bunch of dumb fishermen. And God said, you know, you're going to stand before kings. You little dumb fishermen. <laughs> you're going to stand before people of importance. Yes. And I'll tell you what, don't let that bother you. Don't even worry about what you're going to say. You just, you just be available, be dependable. And I'll tell you in that moment what you need to say. Well, that's comforting. Amen. But you've got to get out there and get before the king. You've got to step out of the boat. You've got to move forward. You've got to take the reins and say, you know, my father's been faithful to me. I'll be faithful to him. That's the cry of genuine leadership. Godly leaders, leaders that make a difference in the world, people who've been proven like Timothy. Is faithful. Let's stand with our heads bowed.